Yes, you can borrow a pen. Um, if you can find one. Actually, I think in that cup right back there, there is a... Yeah, All right. Um, but kind of going with uh, what we were talking about, if, if, uh, if you are, if you would rather kind of do the books of the Bible in uh, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, you can do that. Um, I will be around. Oh, it's actually working. Um, uh, right after after class, uh, we can go ahead and kind of start working on getting those. Um, so last week we we kind of finished um, halfway through the uh, the first lesson, and and part of that was I really just wanted to try to make sure that you guys understood um, faith and, and kind of know where we were at and uh, kind of get the the basic idea for what the class is like. We've, uh, Trinidu or Trinidu? Trinidu. 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 Alright. Alright. Let me try to get that. Um, I wanted to, just kind of give you guys a, a we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, not really fly through, but we're going to kind of fly through, at least at a, at a very, um, high level, um, questions two, three, four, and six of, um, of the, the catechism. Um, since you guys are, are working on memorizing the, the books of the Bible, um, we're not going to go through all of those. You, you guys can be looking at them. But remember, you can also use these as you're, as you're working on the memorization. And then we're going to talk about God's Word, and then we're going to go straight into um, law and gospel, so that we can get into the, um, the sermon summary. So, um, with all of that, let's begin with a prayer, and we'll get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks um, for this day that you've given us. We thank you for, um, for all of these great kids who are here, and I pray that you continue to bless them as they grow in their faith, um, strengthened by your word. I pray that uh, you will be with us this evening as we talk about um, your word, what it means for us, and Lord, the, the law and the gospel that helps guide and direct our lives, and uh, gives us that knowledge that you are the one who has come to save us and uh, have given us eternal life. Um, bless all those who are not here, and we encourage them to be um, present um, when possible. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so does everybody have a catechism now? No. All right. got one here for you guys. And uh, it is fresh. Why? Um, and and, uh, it, and you kind of go um, through this, a lot of this is going to be, um, you kind of keep your finger where we were at because it's going to be falling right down, um, right down the line. So we were on page, I think it was 43 last time, or was it, yeah, 43. And we talk about what is the Christian faith. Christian faith is the confession that Jesus Christ is the world's only Savior and Redeemer. Okay? Um, that is incredibly important for, um, for us to, to understand. Um, it is Christian because it is the confession of who Jesus Christ is. Um, and, and, and very specifically, um, who... Who he is in regards to um, to God, right? He is not a a son, as in a creation or a lesser God. He is the one true God. He is the Son of God. And we look at um, Father and you know, God the Father, God the Son, 
and the Spirit, that's going to, uh, we're, we're going to talk about that later as we focus on that relationship, right? It's not necessarily that D Jesus as Son, like, came from the Father, right? As, as, like, as a part of the creation. He is um, in a, uh, in the relationship uh, aspect, He is the Son, right? So, so just as, um, as I would talk to my son, the son go and grab me the remote so that way I could turn on my favorite television show, right? Uh, I, I give the commands, my son says, yes, Dad, um, and he always does that, you know, with absolute perfect, um, no, no rolling of the eyes or anything like a teenager, okay? He does it, like, so guys, right, you got a high standard, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but I, I give the commands, my son follows directions, right? Now, so that is the relationship between me and my son. Um, it's the relationship between God and Jesus. Okay. Now, it's not that Jesus is any less of a God. He is 100% God, as the scriptures talk about. But, in his role as son, he followed the commands of the Father. All right? um, so, as we look at this, let's go ahead and um, look at question two. Um, which is on page 43 also. Who is Jesus? And as we're looking at the... Um, oh, Allie, I got to go through all these things here. Okay, so the faith, remember that, we all talked about that. Faith, all right. Who is Jesus Christ? As we look at that, which, can, uh, can somebody read that for me out loud? Um, who, who wants to read? Who, who can... Who can read it? Who's got a loud, booming voice? All you guys, right? All right, Micah, I'm going to call you out. Jesus is true God and true man in one person. He is the eternal Son of the Father, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, to be our Savior and Lord. This is God who became flesh in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, is the only true God and Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. All right. So when I say who is Jesus, when we first start from there, what does that say? Jesus is? He's true God. True God and true man, right? True God and true man in one person. Uh, that would be the way of us saying that he is 100% God and 100% man, uh, but it is in the one person, Jesus Christ. So, that person is Jesus. All right, how many gods are there? Kind of read through that. Jesus Christ is the only true God. Holy, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so there is how many, how many gods? Even though there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how many gods are there? Broken. One. One God. Right? One God in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So how many gods are there? There is one. It's the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do we know the one true God? Now this one just it's, it's a little bit harder here because it doesn't necessarily point all of this out in here. But if you look at here, it says John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Go therefore make disciples of all these, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, Matthew 13, or Matthew 3, 13 through 17 says, we hear um, the Father's voice as he pours out the Holy Spirit on Jesus at his baptism. So when we think about all of this together, right, how do we know about God? David, when did you first hear about God? When you start going to church when you're little, right? And, and you hear the pastor talking about about God. Anybody know one of those really is a really great theological song that everybody knows, and I think you all know it. 
Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Right? Where did you learn that song from? Probably some of the people that are sitting right here next to you guys. Right? We learn these little songs, right, from our parents. We learn them from our Sunday school teachers. We learn we learn them in, in, in uh, confirmation classes. These are all things that help guide us to know about God. Most of the time we hear about it in the scriptures, in the reading of scriptures. Okay? But we have those because God came to us, right? And he how did he come to us? Through Jesus. Right? Jesus. Jesus came and 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 we hear about him and his holy word. So he has revealed himself through his word, and in particular through Jesus. Um, if you would like, um, I, I put up on uh, on the Beautiful Savior YouTube channel our, our very first um, uh, confirmation class. So if you, you can look up uh, YouTube, Beautiful Savior YouTube account. And then um, under the videos, it has um, Redeemer confirmation. So you can look, you can find that in there. But if you would also, if you'd like, if you go down to the youth videos, um, I'm actually finishing up a, a, a three-part Bible study um, this next weekend. I'm finishing up this three-part Bible study on the Word, and and uh, it talks about um, the Word being um, Jesus Christ and um, and how that Word works in this world. So uh, if you'd like, you kind of maybe you can look at some of those. It's like a it's like a 40-minute. Um, I will say, can we go like 45 minutes and then we stop it and hide and load and all that stuff? So it's like a 45 minute Bible study. But, um, go to the YouTube channel, you can look at those. It's, I mean, kind of, I think it's a pretty Bible study. I, mean, I always feel bad. I feel, like I feel weird when I say stuff like that because it's like, well, I wrote it. I'm not like trying to get it. Um, but it's just, it was a good Bible study. I, I like it. So. Yeah. All right, he revealed himself through Jesus. All right, what? Has the one true God done? Catechism part, uh, question three. What has this one God done? Ava Sambo. Can read that paragraph there for us. God made all things and loves his creation, especially his human creatures. Beginning with our first parents, all humanity has rebelled against him and fallen into darkness, sin, and death. God the Father sent his only son into the world to become man and to redeem and save humanity by his death and resurrection. God sent his spirit so that people might bless the and be his own through faith in his son, Jesus, who is the world's only hope of life and salvation. All right, so whenever we look at this, there's, I mean, it's a, it's a great big long paragraph, but it talks about two specific things that the one true God has done. What is what are um, what are those at the very beginning? Mike. He made all things. Okay, he has made all things. And second, dang it, I pushed the button too soon. Remember, Rogan, what else does he do? He made all things and or question three, which is on page forty-four. No, of your of your catechism there. God made all things and I actually, I accidentally put page 43, or 44. What's that? Okay, well, that is that is the next part of this, where he sent his son into the world to save us, but he loves us. Okay, so God created us, he loves us. How do we know that he loves us? Addison, how do we know that he loves us? He sent Jesus to save us. Okay, he sent Jesus. So, um, you, you wouldn't send somebody that you didn't, I mean, if you didn't, you wouldn't send anything to anybody that you didn't care for, right? And especially you wouldn't send your son, all right? And, and, and that is something that we do as we look at, um, that is, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? He gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but everyone's life. All right, question four, all right? Why don't you go ahead and read that for us? Ava has a trend to do. Is that right? Yeah. Alright. The creation is somehow redeemed by the power and work by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. In this dream of the Apostles of Jesus Christ, as the Jew and the Lord. In baptism, the Christian is adopted into the Jews. He's the Father's family of the Church. Okay. So when we talk about a Christian, um, 
if we were to just say the very basic thing that it takes to be a Christian, what do you think that is? Anyone? Anyway. What, what is the word Christian? How if we were to break it down, what, what was the first part of it that gives us the basic meaning? Christ, right? So we are Christ followers. That is what a Christian is. Now this gives us obviously a little bit deeper understanding. Someone who by the power and work of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, believes and confesses Jesus, the Christ, as Savior and Lord and God. Um, and, and, and as we look at, uh, we're going to be looking at John here in just a little bit when we get into the Word, and that's going to be talking about, um, and actually, in about two questions. Uh, it's going to be talking about how how we come to know the Lord and what um, what this all means. All right. So, Christian is someone who, by the power of the work and work of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, believes in and confesses Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now, if you remember that, that's going to be very helpful as we get into the um, um, the third article of the Creed, because that talks about the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay. And what are the jobs of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is to create faith. So, um, remember that as we move on. And I, again, I, I, I apologize for, for running through this, but I wanted to get to long gospel. Catechism question six. Where do we learn about Jesus? And we kind of talked a little bit about this um, already, but if you were to read this out, but Addison, you want to read that for us there? Page 46. God's truth about Jesus Christ is made known by the Bible and its central message. We call this truth the gospel, namely the promise of the forgiveness of sins for Jesus' sake. Okay, so as we're looking at this, okay, um, we look at it through the scriptures. But when we talk about Jesus and what he has done for us, okay, this is... In, in, in the part of the Bible that we actually call the Gospels, right? And, and the word gospel literally means good news, okay? So what is the good news that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Those, those, those are the books of the Bible that talk about Jesus. Well, I mean, all right, great. They all, the Old Testament points toward Jesus, the New Testament, you know, Points back to Jesus, and then the Gospels are all about Jesus, right? So, what? Why? What is the good news about Jesus? What, what, what did Jesus do for us? He died on the cross for us. Okay, he died on the cross um, for our sins, and why is that important? Because in our sinfulness, we all understand that we are sinful, that we do not deserve eternal life and salvation. We, we actually deserve to be burning in hell for the rest of eternity. That's what we deserve. Right? But the good news is Jesus died on the cross to take the place of us and to pay that price. Uh, I, people like to get this, you get this idea that, that you know, when they say your sins are washed away, and we kind of get this idea that it's like, Oh, they just, they just were gone. No, they, they weren't just gone. Um, when we talk about God, God is a just God, and we'll talk about that later as we go, but, but just in the meaning of justice, okay? When you go to court, okay, if you're driving down the road and you're going too fast and you get a ticket and you want to go to court, um, they fine you, so you have to pay the, the penalty, right? And then at the end, what do they say? Justice has been served. Right? Well, when, when we sin, what do we deserve? Death and eternal damnation. Well, if God is a just God, he can't just wash those away like nothing ever happened. But instead, justice has to be done. And that justice is somebody has to die for that. Thanks be to God. Jesus died in our place. So it's not as if, oh, they're just washed. No. They were paid for by his blood. Thank God, not ours. All right. Um, so 
we, we, do, we learn this uh, about Jesus through the gospel, which is the good news that we have. All right, um, so those are the books of the Bible. Got them all memorized? Good. Okay, let's go. All right, now, what is the purpose of the Bible? Um, John chapter 20, and, and I'm just going to say, go ahead and, and, like, I don't know if some of you guys are might be... want, you can turn them over, um, or just put something in there to, to save the spines that we find getting destroyed. Um, uh, these are yours, by the way. So you, these catechisms, those are yours. You can keep them. So you, if you want to write in them or, or circle things, you can do that. Don't don't think that you can't. Yeah, they're, they're yours. Okay? Alright, so John chapter 20, which is at the very end of John's gospel, which is his um, good news. He talks about um, the things that Jesus did. Um, if if uh, you have your Faith Alive Bible, that's great. It'll help you understand. If you go to the ESV Bible, I mean, they're, the Faith Alive and the ESV Bible are, the, are all the same. Uh, in 20 verses uh, 3, it says, um, now, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But then verse 31 says something really important. Micah, what is that? But these are the written, but these are the written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by the believing you may have life in his name. Alright. So this is talking about in the, when you read the whole book of John, right, it talks about all these miracles that Jesus did. Okay, the, the changing of water to wine, walking on the water, healing the sick, um, feeding the 5,000, the, the, you know, driving out demons, just all of these things. And then it says here that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So I can't even imagine, what are the other things that Jesus did? Okay, not necessary for us to know right now. But these, the ones that you, are, that you have that are written for you in the scriptures here, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name, okay? Now, I know, you know, you always see this JC, right, as in, you know, Jesus Christ. Well, that's not his last name. It is his title, right? That's what he is. He is Jesus the Christ. The Christ has a very Old Testament meaning, and it talks about the anointed one, the one who is going to come and die for his people, the one who's going to lead um, all Israel. This is, this is the title of who Jesus is. And so when you look at the, all these stories, and all of these miracles and signs that Jesus did, they all point to one thing, that he's the Christ. He is the anointed one. And so what you'll find is that a lot of these things here they, they reference something that happened in the Old Testament. They, they reference a, a, a prophecy about who the Christ will be. And so, so John is really cool. He, he tells us all of these things right up front that you will know that Jesus is the Christ. So this is written really for more of a Jewish audience because the Jews are the ones who were looking for the Christ. And so they were looking for this and they were like, oh wow, that's right, look at all those things that he did. That the, the deaf were were healed, the blind were able to see, the lame were able to walk, and that's all the way back to Isaiah, the prophet who was talking about the Christ. So, so John is telling us who Jesus is, and then through that, through knowing that Jesus is the Christ, then we have salvation. We, we have that understanding that he is the one who's come to save us. And we have faith and trust in him. Alright, now, just running through this, the Bible is whose word? God's, God's word. All right. Um, now, what does that mean? Does this mean that this Bible is perfect? Well, push too hard. All right. The Bible it says is inerrant, and and that means that it means without error. Now, what will a lot of people tell you about the Bible? When was it first written? Who wrote it? Who wrote the Bible? Okay, many people wrote the Bible, okay? Um, you, you had Moses who wrote the, the first five books of the Bible. Um, you, Samuel wrote some. You got um, David, helped write Psalms. Solomon, his son, um, wrote Proverbs. And all. 
you got the prophets that wrote all their books. In the, Old, in the New Testament, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and wrote those. Paul wrote a ton of them. Um, and then you've got James, and you've got Peter, and you've got um, Jude, and, and James, um, and then the very end, John wrote, wrote Revelation. Right? All of these are written right, by a number of people, but all of them, and then we'll get into this as we get further on, but um, all of these um, scriptures are God-breathed, meaning that God spoke them. Right, um, and especially when you look at Jesus and what what did the Gospels, right? Because Jesus actually spoke, and they actually wrote down the things that he that he taught, the things that Paul teaches about. Those are all things that Jesus taught, in, that taught him. And so, and so, when he's writing these things down, yes, he's writing using his words, but he is telling us what Jesus taught him. Okay, just like if I told you. Um, a story about myself, and you went and told somebody else that same story, right? Would you use the exact same words? Probably not, but it's the same story, okay? So when we look at all this, we say that it is, it is written by God. He is the author. He is the one who, who directed them. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, talking about um, how, how they are um, inspired, people were inspired um, by God's word, or inspired to write God's word. Um, but the reality is, these were written down by mankind. Okay? So, there's going to be a lot of people who say, well, the Bible has errors in it. It has mistakes. It has problems. And, if you were to actually look at some of the copies that were written down, yes, there were actually mistakes. Um, I, I've got, uh, I've got a, a, a Hebrew Bible and, in, and I've got a Greek Bible, and in, the, and in the middle of these and on the bottom, they have all of these different variant readings or all of these different things. And it gives us, okay, this one was more than likely a mistake where someone wrote down the wrong word or they, they skipped a line or something like that. So there are mistakes that happen in the copying of the process. Okay, but the words themselves actually are, are very, very um, accurate. Um, what they found um, in the, uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and again, there's, there's another really cool Bible study, if you guys want to look, look it up, um, go to Lutheran's Hour, Lutheran Hour uh, Ministries uh, Men's Network, and they have a Bible, or a, a Bible study called the uh, Bible on Trial. It's like a four-part Bible study, but it goes into how um, these, these, uh, these uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in Qumran um, were very accurate. Um, whenever they wrote down, uh, they copied these things down, and they literally had to count not just words, but they counted letters to make sure that every single letter, every single word um, was, was copied down correctly. Now, we're here. Right? We're fallible. We're sinful. We, we make mistakes. That's just the way it is. Um, so, so these Masoretes who are, who are copying these things, they would make mistakes. But the teachings that, that we have that come from the scriptures, are, are, there are no mistakes in those. Because as you look at those and all the translations and how they all work together, they, they fit. They make sense. They, they don't change. Um, even those little mistakes that they, that they did have, um, which, they, which they're up front, they tell us about it, right? Even those, right, they don't change the meaning of the scriptures. Um, they're, the changes from the very beginning to what we have now, it's just minor. And, and, and they're not of any significance in a theological way. So when we look at this, does this mean that, there's, that it, it doesn't, it, 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 the error here is not in the copying, the error um, that, that we're talking about here that is without error, is in, is in the teachings and, and the, the faith that it, that it gives us. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that... Okay. If not, just say, yeah, and we'll talk about that. All right. Two main teachings. Law and gospel. Remember when I talked about gospel. What does gospel mean? Salvation. So law, and a lot of times people look at the law and they say the law is bad. 
Because, I mean, obviously if the gospel is good news, then what's the law? Oh, that must be bad. No, the law is awesome. The law is great. We need the law. Doesn't always make us feel good. We'll talk about that when we get into the next unit. All right. Um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, because a lot of these people talk about the Old Testament containing the law and the New Testament containing the gospel, but the reality is there's a lot of gospel in the Old Testament. Um, one of the first cases of gospel is when Adam and Eve, uh, they ate the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, and, and God came and, and said, you know, what's the problem? What are you doing? And, uh, and they said that um, there will be enmity between you and, and the serpent, um, between you being, being his offspring and your offspring. But your offspring is going to do what? Going to crush the head. Of Satan, All right? That's the that's that's the first hint of the gospel that there's going to be someone, one of her offspring, is going to crush Satan. Is going to crush sin. That is a that is a, a message of good news that there is going to be um, salvation. It's going to be relief from pain and suffering. Um, so when we look at this, um, the Old Testament has both law and gospel, and so does the New Testament. When Jesus talks about um, whether or not, uh, when we talk about murder, right? We see the Old Testament, the um, Exodus, when it talks about the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder, right? So we always think about that as just <coughs> killing somebody. But, what does Jesus say in the New Testament? If you call somebody fool, if you, if you are mean to your brother, you've committed murder. So there is law in the New Testament. Um, so, so don't just get this idea that the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is gospel. There's, there's law and gospel in both. Talk about this a little bit ago. The Old Testament points to Jesus as our Savior. All right. Real quick. The Old Testament has 39 books. And if you want to know real quick, an easy way to remember this, if you look at old, how many letters are in old? Three. How many letters are in testament? Nine. Nine. Three and nine, thirty-nine. Now, in the New Testament, oh, sorry, I'm to get to this next. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a little Aramaic. New Testament tells of Jesus. How many books are there in the New Testament? What is how many how many letters are in three? Or in in new. Three. Testament? Nine. Multiply three times nine? Twenty-seven. All right? I don't, I don't know how that is going to help anybody, but sometimes if, if, if you're one of those kids that, that has a little, three and nine for Old Testament, three and nine times twenty-seven. All right. The Old Testament uh, was Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament is written in Greek. Um, thank you to um, Alexander the Great. All right. Um, read the books of the Bible, memorize them, and now uh, we'll move on to that. So I know I really rushed through those, but now we're going to get to the next. on that first part, though, I, just, I, I know I ran through it, but again, this is really going to be more kind of an introduction part of it, and it's really, we're going to get into a lot more of this in a lot greater detail later on, so, um, but if you have any questions, um, then just let me know. All right, so now we're going to get to lesson two, which is law and gospel. Two basic doctrines of the Bible. 
law and gospel similarity. So remember we talked about law, and, and we think about, what, is, what do you think about when you think about law? What do you think about? First thing that comes to mind. Anyway. Like kind of? An instruction, right? Something you have to do. Okay? Um, parents, when you think of a law, what do you think of? Police. Police, right? So you do something wrong, police are there to make sure that you either pay the price for it or, or make sure that you do it. Right? So we think of these, these laws, the police are there to make sure we do what we're supposed to do. They're instructions for our life, right? Those are the law things, they're guides, they're, they're rules. Okay? Ten Commandments are, are laws. Those are the things that, that, that give us a guide to how we live our life. Um, gospel, what does that mean? Everybody, one, two, three. Alright, good news. We're going to get that. By the time we leave here today, when I say gospel, you're going to say? Good news. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Alright, All right, so the law and the gospel, um, they do have a lot of similarities. Things that they do have in common. Um, when we look at law and gospel in the scriptures, right, it, it, it comes from the Bible, so we know that the law and the gospel are what? They are both God's word. I'm going to say Pastor Schultz did this um, PowerPoint, so when you see the words come bouncing in, that's Pastor Schultz, that is not me. I don't like the whole bouncing thing. I actually like the ones where it just is like, or, you know, or fades in or something like that. So bounce, just, just kind of annoying to me. That's Pastor Schultz. All right. If they're both God's word, is that good or bad? It's good. So if, if we have something like the Ten Commandments, if we have things that tell us how we should live our lives, even though we, we realize we're not doing them, we're sinful, is, is the law bad? No. The law is actually good. i got a question for you. Um, has anybody ever seen... Um, what is that? There's a movie uh, where where they have this uh, one day, one night, where there are no rules. Purge. The Purge. Yes. <laughs> purge. I've never actually seen it. But I've just heard about it, right? So, so the Purge. What is the Purge about? You guys, you guys know? What's the Purge about? All the other guys. Oh no, I don't know anything about it. I've never seen it. Yeah. The right. Purge is about where. No loss for 25 hours. Is it okay to murder someone? Yep. Yeah. Is it okay to steal? Yep. Yeah. Is it okay to uh, murder, pillage, rape, steal, plunder, all that? Yep. Could you imagine living in that? If you walked out your door and, and someone could just come up to you and blow your brains out for no reason at all, what kind of a life would that be? Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Right? Um, if, if you have kids... And you guys are going to grow up, you're probably going to have kids, they're going to go to school, they're walking through a school zone, and someone is flying through at 90 miles an hour and takes out all the kids. Is the law good or bad? The law is good, right? Because it keeps people from doing stupid things, right? Well, it should, but, but we are sinful, right? So the reality is, the law is good. God wants good things for you. When he gives you the Ten Commandments, he's not, he's not up there writing these things down going like, oh, Ava's going to have a hard time with that one. I can't wait to see how she squirms around that. Oh, and Micah, oh, boy, he's going to really struggle with that one. Ah, oh, I'm going to get these guys so bad. Think that's what God's doing? No. He's like, I don't want anybody to hurt my people. So murder should be done away with. Do you, do you guys, do you guys want, how, how would you like to have your wife all of a sudden say, yeah, you know, Brogan, I'm, I love you, but I, I, this guy over here, he's a lot cuter, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to divorce you and I'm going to go live with him. How would you like that? Hi, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> Smack you. Maybe, 
We don't like that. We don't want that, right? Because we want, we want spouses to be faithful to each other. How would you like someone to come and just steal all of your stuff? See, God doesn't want that for you either. So the law that he gives us is good because he wants us to, this is his will for our lives, so that we have a good life. Could you imagine if everybody followed the law perfectly? Would we need pastors? Nope. Because you guys would be perfect. Would we need policemen? Nope. Because no one would be doing anything wrong if we all followed God's law. But the reality is, we don't. Which is what makes God, the gospel so much more important. All of these, though, are God's words. The law and the gospel are both God's words. So they're both good. All right? Um, if you didn't have the gospel, you were stuck with the Old Testament. Or not the Old Testament, you were stuck with the, with the law. What would that mean? If you didn't have that good news of salvation, what would that mean for you? Eternal death. It means eternal death. Okay, so you need the gospel. But if you don't have the law, do you need the gospel? If, if there is no law, talking about like if there's like a purge, right, and there's no need for forgiveness, do you need the gospel? No. So the reality is both of these, while they're both God's word, they're both very necessary. We both need them. Okay? They are necessary. You have to have the, the, the law. You have to have the gospel. If it weren't for, if you didn't have either one of those, or if you didn't have one or the other, the, things wouldn't be right. Okay? So, so this is why they're both very necessary for all of us. Um, they are also both to be taught to all people. So when I say all people, there's really, and this is going to sound really weird, but there's, there's a couple of different kinds of people in the world. There are people who believe in Christ, there are, there are the believers, and there are the unbelievers. Right? Is it, is it important to teach unbelievers about God's law? And, and, and as we get into what, we're, what, what this is, the whole chapter is about, we'll understand why this is important. If, if somebody is living their life in sin and they don't know it, then they don't feel like they need Jesus. So, so when we look at the law, people need to know that they're sinful. Because when they know that they're sinful, then they know that they need a Savior. And who's the Savior? I'm just going through Jesus. Right. All right, so then you can talk to people. Um, both of them, uh, the law and the gospel, we just talked about this earlier, are both found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then um, both of us show us the way to oh, excuse me, be saved. Okay? Um, but because they're both necessary... They show us the way to be saved in tandem, right? They have to be working together in order for this um, to take place. All right. But there are also differences between the law and the gospel, okay? Um, we'll start off here with the law. The law shows us what? Shows us our what? Sin. Sin, right? The law shows us our sin. Um, whenever, we, whenever we read the Ten Commandments, we look through it and we're like, mess that one up. Alright? It shows me that I am a simple person. The gospel, what does the gospel show us? Starts with an S. Savior. Savior, that's right. The law shows us our sin. The gospel shows us our Savior. Alright? Um, the message of the law for us is what? I've already kind of told you guys this. If you sin, you deserve what? Eternal 
and death, right? Because you've broken the law. Um, all have fall, sinned and fallen short of the, of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Um, the law is the breaking of, of God's word, God's commands, and so we deserve death whenever we, whenever we transgress God's law, when we break God's command. The gospel is a message of what? If one is death, it's not necessarily the opposite, so it's not just life, but what would we call that? It's another S word. Anybody know the Spanish word for salt? Sal. 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 Salvation. Salvation. The message of salvation for us. All right. All right. So. Um. So, so rules, right, rules are things that you are supposed to do, right? Um, and so, so when we talk about the law, we talk about that it places a demand on us. It demands that we do something, okay? Um, you shall have no other gods before me. What's the demand? That you have no other gods. That you have no other gods. Right? That, that God is the only God in your life. So that is why it's really important to look at what it asks us to do. Now, think about this, especially whenever we start talking about, remember, I'm going to give you a list of things in here, and you're going to have to look at it and say, is this law or is this gospel? Right? And one of the ways we can look at that is, does it demand that we do something or not do something? Right. Um, so the um, so that the law demands that we do something, something. But the gospel does the gospel require anything of us? No. So it is a free gift. The law accuses and. If, if, um, if we see that, um, let's see, let's say we saw Brogan was um, walking down the street and he saw somebody else, he saw Ava's bike and said, I like that bike. And so he, he, he takes the bike and runs off with it. A little did he know that somebody had a ring set up and it caught him on camera stealing that bike. And so in a court, the judge looks at this and says, Brogan, you're guilty. What does that mean? It means you are... You're not innocent. You're not innocent. You are guilty, and, and that is a, you are being condemned then, like the judge. Like, so you're going to have to pay back whatever, give the bike back. Whatever. So you have been condemned by your actions. Okay. So when we look at the law, it, it condemns us for what we do, or what we don't do, I guess, in some way. Um, the gospel promises mercy, and if, so if, the, if the law accuses and condemns, the gospel, what does it do? What does it show? Mercy and grace. Grace, and another word for that. When, when Ava would say, bro, I know you're an idiot for stealing my bike, but I forgive, forgive. Right? So it shows mercy and forgiveness. Um, the law, uh, if you have to pay back something that is called a, or if, you, if, you are a, uh, if you're cheating on a test, the teacher catches you after school, you get put in detention, that is what? Punishment. Punishment, right? So the law punishes us. But what does the gospel do? Instead, it's another P word. And, and it's actually a, 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 again, it's kind of another, um, when, when, like when a president runs and it comes out of office, he, he gives out a whole bunch of these to people who are already in jail. They call them pardons. Like 
presidential pardon, right? So if you get in good with the president, right, whenever you, if, you're, if you're in jail and you get in good with the president, the president can say, um, bro, I'm going to make Brogan out to be a really bad guy. <laughs> so, Addison, you're, you're an evil person, but you know what? I'm going to give you a pardon so you can get out of jail free. Okay? It, it, it means that, you, that, that the penalty for your sins is, is taken away, right? And, and you're free to go. That's, that's the pardon. Right? The other difference is that um, the, the law commands us what to do and not to do. And then the gospel reveals Jesus, what Jesus has done for us. And kind of running through these guys. Right? Just trying to get them. Um, you may remember when Jesus was in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, and and he was um, he's praying, and, and and there was blood running down his face from the sweat, and and he said, um, "Let this cup pass by me, but not my will, your will be done." When he's talking about this cup, okay, he's talking about what what John tells us in Revelation, a cup of wrath, okay? And, and, and God's wrath is his, um, his anger towards sin. Um, we don't like to think of God in this way, right? Um, what do we like, how do we like to think of God? He's the Savior, right? One who gives salvation to us. Maybe a P. Um, Forgiveness, right? Do we like to think about God's wrath? So, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, um, let there be um, the heavens and then uh, all of these things. He had, he had that much power to just say something and it happened. Right? Um, in the Old Testament, when, when they had the Ark of the Covenant, and, and God said, Don't touch the Ark. There's only the only people that can, can carry it and have to use these wooden poles, they're the only ones that can carry it. And, and the oxen stumbled, and the guy reached out his hand. Good intentions, right? He didn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall. So he reached out his hand, and he touched it to steady it. What, what did God do? Struck him dead right there on the, on the ground. Killed him. Why did he do that? Why? He didn't listen. Because he didn't listen. He broke his command. And immediately struck him dead. That's God's wrath. So imagine, right, we do something stupid, and what's stopping God from just saying, Ava, that's the last time. Boom, you're dead. What's stopping him? His grace. His grace, right? Through the Son Jesus. So the law shows us the wrath of God. The gospel shows us his grace. Very good. All right. Um, if, if, if I were to think about, you know, like if, if I were Ava, right, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to sin, I'm getting ready to do something really bad, right, and, and then all of a sudden you do it, and then there's like, oh, Christ, Jesus, God, God going to kill me right now, right? There's that fear, right? So the law brings fear to us or terror in our hearts, but what does the gospel bring? Hit the button too fast. <laughs> I hate when I do that, because it gives you the answer. So that's it. It's peace and joy. Because, because Ava's like, oh my gosh, 
I deserve to die. But Jesus already did. Thank you, Jesus. Right? You have that peace knowing that even though I deserve death, I get life. And that peace and joy. All right. Can the law help you? The law cannot help us as sinners. Um, Jesus says, um, or, or, or Paul says that no one can be made righteous by the law. Which means that nobody can keep the law perfectly. And if nobody can keep the law perfectly, then no one can be saved. But, Jesus did. Um, so the gospel frees us and makes us alive in Christ. A couple more. The law produces guilt. I see that one doesn't even have the thing that bounces in there. The law produces guilt, despair, and sorrow. The gospel creates... Think about these, as we're, as we're looking at these, right, that when we look at how they fit in our lives, okay, um, the law has all of these, and, and it, I hate to say bad things, right, but when the law shows us our sin, right, it helps us to understand who we are. It helps to understand that we are sinful. And, and, and that is a good thing because it helps us to realize that, that we need a Savior. Um, it's a message of death for us. It doesn't mean that we are going to die, but it is a message of death, meaning that that is what we deserve, which humbles us. Helps us to realize that, that, that there is, that, that we need salvation, and that salvation comes. So while all of these seem like really bad things, they are things that when they work in our human nature, they help us to realize what we need. They help us to realize that, that we are sinful scumbags and we deserve nothing but death. And the only person who can save us is Jesus. And when we have that, we have that peace, we have that salvation, we have that, that, that great joy of knowing that our life, our salvation is secure in what he has done. All right. Any questions so far? All right, we're going to do this again. Applying law and gospel. All right, so distinguishing law and gospel is the task of every... What? Is it every person or is it every Christian? It's every Christian. Now, why is, it, why is distinguishing between law and gospel not the task of a non-Christian? What do you think, Rogan? They don't believe. Because they don't believe. They don't even believe the, the, the law, so why would they even care about the gospel? Right? But for you and me, right, we need to understand the difference between the law and the gospel because it is necessary. Right? It, it works in us so that we can have faith. It helps us to understand um, our standing in this world and where we need to go. So it, it, it's the law, or it's the task of every Christian uh, to be able to distinguish those. The blank, oh, sorry, the law blank those who are comfortable in their sin. The gospel blank those who are convicted by their sin. And if you look at that last one, it kind of gives you the, <laughs> the answer there. The law convicts, sorry, sorry, I thought I heard somebody say that. The law convicts those who are comfortable in their sin. The gospel, it's another C word. If you are convicted by your sin, if you know that you are a sinful person, that, that whenever uh, you saw, uh, whenever you saw, Where's Trey at? Why was here right there? See, that's why you guys, when you were here. So, when, when you saw Micah, right, and you just thought, oh, he's such a fool, 
right? You're breaking the God's God's commandments, right? To, to murder, right? So so when you when you do that, you realize, oh, shoot, I really shouldn't have I shouldn't have been so mean to Micah. I really shouldn't have. And and then and then the pastor says, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. Instead of feeling convicted, how do you feel? Does that let the other C word that? It's also like these chairs are not very, they're very hard and they hurt. I'm just saying they're too long. They're not. Right? So the gospel comforts those who are convicted by their sin. The good news of salvation. So the gospel is. Good news, thank you. The gospel is good news. The good news is that our sins are forgiven, so we find comfort in those. Those who are sorry for their sins and desire forgiveness are directed to the word and sacraments. All right, I just threw those in there because um, why are why are the word and sacraments? given to us as a means of grace. What, what do you think that means? We, we, so like, if, if you go to church, right, and we talk about the sacraments, what are the, the things that you think about? You guys know the sacraments. Addison, can you give me a sacrament? When you go up to the community, the rail, and you receive what? The wine. Okay, the bread and the wine. And we call that communion, right? We go to communion. Um, communion being the, the communion of sinners, right? We are all part of the same faith. That is why we come up together, um, and which is also why we have a closed communion, right? Because it's not just about you and God, it's about you and your neighbor. Right? So if you are if you are having a fight, I mean, and we, we've had this problem before, right? We've had we've had a, a husband and a wife who were um, they were going through a really nasty divorce. And um, God wants unity. He wants unity between you and me and between each other. So when they were having these difficulties, it's like, okay, you guys need to get this figured out. And until then, you shouldn't be receiving the Lord's Supper because as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, he talks about it is not the Lord's Supper because there are divisions among you. And so we, we talk about this. This is, a, this is a means of grace where we are here to receive God's body, but Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That is gospel. That is good news. That is grace. Okay? And so, so we receive in the sacraments forgiveness. What's well, another sacrament that we receive forgiveness? And this one has to do, most of you guys, when you were little babies. Baptism, right? We get to dunk those babies. All right? Don't, don't dunk them. Right? But we do a lot of water, though. I think it's just, you know, douse those kids. Right? Because it is the forgiveness of sins. Peter talks about that. Um, Baptism is for, is for you and your children, um, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is baptism. This is a, it's where we get the forgiveness of sins. Where do we get the forgiveness of sins through the Word? Hmm. Difficult. Now we do talk about this. Uh, and it's in every. It's every. Uh, well, it should be in every service. Jesus at the beginning. Call it the, the CNA. <laughs> confession and absolution, right? We confess our sins, and then the absolution comes to us through um, through God's word. Now, when we talk about salvation, when we talk about faith, how does that come to us? How do we receive faith? Through the reading of the 
what? Okay. That's, and, 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 and when God's word comes to us, the Holy Spirit works in us, bringing us faith. And if we have faith, what do we have? Jesus. We have Jesus. And if we have Jesus, we have forgiveness, life, and salvation. So, so when, when we have uh, the, the desire of forgiveness, we, we, we get that from the word and from the sacraments. Um, those are what brings us um, forgiveness. Um, so, talking about the law, all of God's anger and His wrath for our or for our sin is aimed at who? Jesus on the cross. So remember when I talked about Jesus or about God being a, a, a just God? What we what, what, we are the ones who should be on that cross. We are the ones who should die for our sins. But Jesus took the cup of God's wrath for you, 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 me. Asthma's mom, they just don't walk out here. Pastor Schultz, everybody in the church, everybody took the wrath for all of us. And he paid that price. So, that, so, so whenever we look at this, right, God, God's law is it's, it's it's not something to be messed around with. If you keep breaking the law, you might you might be given grace and mercy, you know, but but you keep doing it and you gotta think, is is God really gonna forgive me all these times? Like you trying? All right, so we are forgiven and saved by grace through faith for the sake of Christ. There's a lot of Bible verses that, that talk about these, and, and that's fine. But uh, we're going to get through those as we get along. This is about 20 minutes. All right. So the gospel must always predominate. What does that mean? It means it always needs to be uh, above all else. Right? It is dominant. Um, but why is that? We naturally know that the, we actually know the law, that the gospel is the law. How do we know the law? I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly simple, right? Our, our, our parents kind of tell us, but don't you just kind of know that you're supposed to listen to your parents? How, how do you know that? Yeah? They yelled me until I start listening. They... Yes. That was broken. Yes. They yell at you until you start listening. Right? Do you love your parents? And so if you love your parents, do you... Naturally, just want to do good for them. Yeah, right. That, that's that's the way. There, there's there's this natural inclination to to do what we should do, right? Um, how many of you just have the urge to go out and kill somebody? <laughs> this could be a really telling answer. <laughs> okay, probably don't really want to go out and just kill somebody. We might think about it sometimes, but we don't really want to just go out and kill somebody. Because we know that it's wrong. Right? We just know that. That's because the law is written on your hearts. We're going to talk about that a little bit as we get a little bit further. But the reality is the law is, is written on our hearts. And so there are things that we know are right and wrong. And, and, and some of that is, is, is we call it natural law. Right? Um, if you take a baby or, or, or someone who's... You get to the edge of a cliff. Right? And what do you do? Do you, you just keep walking? Why? Hey, but why do you not walk off the edge of the cliff? You don't want to kill the baby or yourself. <laughs> because you don't want to die, right? You know that you're going to fall. Okay? That's just this natural law that we know. Gravity is a thing. If you don't like gravity, does it change it? No. 
I don't believe in gravity, so I'm going to step off the edge of this building. What's going to happen? Depending on how tall the building is, you might be dead. Right? I don't believe in God's law. Does that matter? No. The consequences are still the same, whether you believe it or not. Okay? So, so there are things on natural law, things that you just know. Right? Um, Alright. Distinguishing between law and gospel. If you look in your books, in your, in your folders here, there are a number of, like, 16 on this one, page 8, and then 25 of these. And we're going to go through these, and remember just all the things that we've talked about with law and gospel, right? Law are things that require us to do things. The gospel is a free gift, talking about Jesus' um, salvation given to us, the forgiveness of sins and all this. So, I, what I want to do, we're going to go through as a group, and we're going to talk about these if they're law or their gospel. Okay? The very first one, pretty easy, right? The good news for salvation is that law or gospel? Gospel, gospel right? Just talking about salvation, is talking about um, good news for us. Teaches us how to live a Christian life. Law or gospel? Law. Law. Because it teaches us how to live, right? The demand is that it teaches us how to live our lives. Okay? It instructs us to do something. So that one is law. Motivates and strengthens us to live a Christian life. Gospel. That one's gospel. Because the gospel motivates us. It doesn't teach us. It doesn't tell us to do this. Right? If, 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 I, uh, if I were to give you $100 and then said, um, can you go and, and grab a Coke out of the refrigerator before you bring it to me? How, what would you do? I'd sprint there and sprint back. Why? Well, because. A hundred bucks. Yeah, right. And, and, and it, was, it was you were motivated to do good, right? Now, was that law? No, that was just the gospel. That was the motivation. Of the <clears throat> God punishes sin. Law or gospel? Law. law. The song we just read. Song. This sound. Jesus loved me. This I know. Oh, so what do you think the next one's going to be? Law. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. The pain, with pain, you will give birth to children. Law or gospel? Law. Law. So what's the next one, do you think? Gospel. That your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. By, by your thought, what is it? Stop judging by mere appearances and make right judgments. Law or gospel? Law. Law? Come now, let us read it together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Gospel. So by your reckoning, the next one should be law, right? Number ten. That good, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What is that? Gospel. That's gospel. So your <laughs> little not working. Ah. It took a while, but <laughs> yeah, let's switch these things around next time. Yeah, so the, the God, uh, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. Right? That, so it's talking about how, how our sins are forgiven. Right? They're not counted against us. They were counted against... They were counted... You know, said so that, that um, they made Christ um, who was not sin to be sin. Right? He was sin incarnate right there on the cross. Um, he is aton the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is a law or gospel. Gospel, right? Because it's talking about the, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Number 13, Mark, 9, Mark 10, 19 says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do 
not defraud honor do not defraud honor your father and your mother law. law when Jesus saw their faith he said friends your sins are forgiven law or gospel Cool. All right. Uh, number 15. What shows the anger of God? Remember we talked about this? The law. What shows God's gracious invitation? Gospel. Gospel. What tells us what God did for us? The gospel. The gospel. What shows us that we are perfect? Which one, and this is not one in here, which one shows us that we are sinful? Uh, number 19. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Law. Law. What demands us to be perfect? Law. The law. Absolutely free. Nothing in life is free. <laughs> what is absolutely free? The gospel. The gospel, right? The grace, God's grace and mercy. Give it to us absolutely free. Do you have to earn your salvation? No. It's given to you. As a matter of fact, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And Christ finds us as his own. What works faith in Christ? Law or gospel? Its promise must be earned. The law. the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Law. law. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light, let you, what you need to do, what do you need to do? Let your light shine. Is that law or gospel? Law. That's law, right? Now, sometimes the law sounds like it could be God, but it's not. It's law. All right, so the next part here, there are three uses or purposes of the law. You guys ever heard of this before? Three uses of the law. That means that the law is going to do one of these three things in your life, or all three things, depending on the state that you're in. What is this? A picture of right up here. A curb. What? A curb. a curb. Right? What is the purpose of a curb? How many of you guys are driving yet? Anybody driving yet? Does a go-kart count? Are there curbs on a go-kart count? <laughs> <laughs> I drive on the road. <laughs> what is the, what's the purpose of the curb? Uh, on a road. Yeah. So you don't actually drive on the yeah. So you might actually drive up. Now, it is possible, I will tell you this, right? If you're driving too fast, and it's really icy, and you hit the brakes, and you're supposed to be running the curb, and you're not doing it, and you're running, you will go up over the curb, okay? It's happened to me before. Don't go too fast on, this, on the ice. But the curb is supposed to keep you on the road, right? Now, let's think about this. If, um... Addison, if you knew that you would get in trouble if you were caught lying, would you lie? No, right? Because you don't want to get in trouble, right? Um, uh, Mike, if you knew that you were that there's a really good chance you're going to get caught and uh, given the death penalty if you kill somebody, are you going to be less likely to do it? Yeah, right? Because we don't want these bad things to happen. So these things keep us in line, right? They keep us on the road, the way that we should be living our lives. Now, the next one is, what does that look like? What's the guy looking into? Mirror. Okay, why do you look in a mirror? To see yourself. To see yourself, right? So when we look at this as a mirror, you, you, you see yourself. If, um, so Paul, Peter, yeah, Paul. Paul talks about this. He says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. You don't know what is sinful unless somebody tells you, right? The, the, 
the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Right? Honor your father and mother. If you had never heard that before, how would you have known if that was that it was one of God's law? Probably wouldn't have really thought about it. You probably wouldn't have known that. But then, all of a sudden, you realize, oh, I've not been honoring my mother and my father. Well, if I break that commandment, then what does that make me? If you're breaking one of God's commandments, what does that make you? A sinner. Right? So, so whenever you look at the law, the law helps show us who we are. And it shows us that we are sinful. It shows us our sins. So whenever we look in the mirror of the law, it shows us the law. What is this guy doing? Leading. He's a leading, right? And that was what we would call a guide, right? So what is the guide? The guide is, this is how you should live your life. Okay? It's, it's not the curve. The curve is one that curves evil outburst, right? I shouldn't be doing this because I'm not going to get in trouble. Right? The mirror shows you what sins are. The guide is, this is how I should live my life. You know, Hebrews talks about, do not give up um, meeting as some people are in the habit of, but continue to, to meet. For example, I'm going to church. Do not but continue to go to church so that you may encourage each other and all the more time. So that is telling us that we should live our life by going to church. Okay? Now, obviously not every day, um, but you know, we should go to church on Sunday. That is the guide for our life. All right. Last page. We're flying through this. You guys are getting so much. All right. Romans 2.15. Everybody look that one up. Romans 2, verse 15. Romans 2.15. It's in the Bible. That was in the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Romans 2.15. And you got it right your hand. Romans is in the New Testament. Alright. Raise your hand if you got it. Also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts, accuser even ex excuse them. Alright, so remember we were just talking about this, right? That that there's just things that you just know, right? This is what Paul is talking about here in Romans. The work of the law is written on their hearts. You guys heard about the conscience, right? Uh oh, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Right? Whenever you just, ah, I just don't feel like that's the right thing to do. Right? That is, that is the law that is written on your heart. <clears throat> so that's what, uh, so what does that mean then? If the law is written on our heart, it means that we have a natural knowledge. Okay, we're talking about that natural law. The natural knowledge in your heart which helps you to know right and wrong. Now, for Christians, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different for Christians because um, we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us, and the Holy Spirit is also there guiding us, and helping us to know right from wrong as well. So that's part of that. But, but, but the natural law, those things, we just know it's just not right. It is not right to kill someone. It is not right to, to dishonor our parents, right? Those are the things that are just naturally known um, to us. Uh, I have a natural knowledge of law. People generally know from know right from from wrong and good from evil. All right. Um, you ever 
had those times when you had the option of doing right or wrong, right? Now, I'm not going to say that you had done it, right? But if, if by chance you might have done the evil thing, how do you feel? Has any of you ever dishonored your parents? Careful how you answer that. How do you feel when you dishonor your parents? Rogan? Disappointed in yourself? Well, you get the right answer, right? You kind of feel bad, right? Shouldn't have done that. Okay? There's that conscience that, that just tells you that you should have done that. So our, our hearts will always accuse us with the law. Alright? Now, think about this. Right? The law is written on your heart. Right? So if the law is written on your hearts, and you naturally have this conscience, that when you do something that is wrong, you just know that it's wrong. Right? It's always there. Right? Your conscience is always with you. So if we were to ask, which one do you think you need to hear the most? The law or the gospel? What do you think it would be? The law is always there. Right? The law is always accusing you. The law is always making you feel bad for doing those things that you know they're wrong. So what do we need to hear, really? The gospel. The gospel. Because the law is always there. Is there any here most often the law or gospel? We need to hear the gospel because we have no natural knowledge of it. It doesn't make sense for someone to die for you. But the fact that Jesus died for your sins, paid the price for your sins, that is an unnatural thing. We have no natural knowledge of the gospel that saves. I'll ask here. Which do you hear most often? from your parents. Ah, that's a tough one. And, and, and it, this is not necessarily a, an indictment against your parents. Maybe it's an indictment against you. What do you hear from your parents most often, do you think? Addison, what do you think? What have your parents told you the most? Law or gospel? Gospel? David? Yeah. Well, what? Is it because your because your mom's mean? Must make your life miserable. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's kind of what I was thinking, right? Yeah. Why do you think your mom tells you the law a lot? Because you're an evil person, right? Yeah, that's true. But why? Else? Give you a line so that when you grow up, you will be a, a, a benefit to society. You'll be a good person living in this world, right? So, so when your mom is telling you, Ava, pick up on your crap from your door in the laundry. <clears throat> Why is she doing that? Because she hates you? No, because she loves you. She wants, it from, wants what's best for you. And she wants you to be able to be a productive member of society, a productive member of the family starting off with. But then that'll go out into the world, right? Am I, am I all right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. right. So, so, so your parents want what's best for you, so they're going to help teach you how to live your lives, to be good kids. Follow the laws, so you don't get thrown in jail. It's a good thing. So they're going to tell you a lot of the law. Do they tell you that they love you? To grow up, to go to college, to learn how to work, to go out and do good things, right? These are 
And the things you need to learn. Do they ever tell you that you're doing a good job? Yeah, they should, hopefully. Right? So that's part of that. But mostly, it's there to teach you. Your conscience, obviously we talk about that. The law. All right. How can you carry the gospel with you so that you will have the comfort of the gospel for yourself and for others? How can you carry the gospel? What is, if we were to pick one symbol of the gospel, what would that be? Why does the cross be one of the biggest symbols of, of the gospel? So, so yeah, so, and you know, there's a lot of those, like, the rappers, and they'll, they'll put on their cross, and, you know, it's just because it makes them look good, but, but, you know, it's like, I got this, I got this when I was getting ready to go to the seminary, and it's got this little cross on it, okay? So what I do when I confirm students, I smack them in the forehead, and it leaves that imprint of the cross on their forehead, and they will remember the gospel their entire life. No, I don't really do that, but, <laughs> I've always thought it. So, if on confirmation night, um, I don't know, I'm trying to you guys. Especially for you, Greg, you might need All right. So we carry the gospel with us. We carry the cross. Um, what are the other things that we can bring around with us? The Bible. The Bible? You read God's word with you? Right? Have it in your, have it in your, in your book bag, right? And, and, and sometimes, even if you don't read it, right, if you know it's there, you open up your book bag every day, right? And you get ready to pull out your biology book, and there's your Bible sitting there right next to it. That remind you, remind you of God's book, remind you of what He's done for you, right? Um, yeah, it would be great if you did read it, but just having it there sometimes is a cool thing. That um, knock the dust off of it. Good. Are there any other things? Any other things? We actually have. They didn't tell us about it until later, but um, before the baptism, they got up and they poured some water from the Jordan River in the water that they baptized my daughter with. And and uh, so we keep that, and it's, it's in our little shelf. It's just that little reminder um, of, of the water from the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, and it reminds us of our baptism when we have the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit when we make children of God. So that's another reminder of the gospel. There's all kinds of things. And, you know, talk about that with your families. Talk about it with them. So, you know, what are the things that we have that remind us about the gospel in our house? You know, it might be paintings on the wall. It might be, you know, stuff on your on your phone even. Right? You know, you're, what do I have? Oh, that's, not, that's not a gospel one. <laughs> that picture of my, my, my son with his first deer. <laughs> and Bash Pro on there. So, all right, maybe I should think about some, some gospel things in there. Think about things in our life, right? Look for the gospel around. Um, then we kind of talked about uh, the sermon summaries um, that, that you guys are going to do. Um, what, what I'd like for you to do, and if you look at these, these sermon summaries, I know I'm running just a couple minutes late, like five, sorry. Um, they should have copies of those over at Redeemer, okay? Um, I think we sent them to Lael, and she's going to make copies of them. And so they will be there at the church, all right? Um, if you don't have any, if, if, you're, if you watch church online for some reason, you can do that as well. But um, you, you write down your name, the date of, of, of worship. Um, if it's a recorded one, okay, write down the date that they have the service. Um, don't worry about church mailbox or anything about that. But then the sermon title and the sermon text, that should be in your bulletin that you receive. And then write the notes, and we talked about it uh, last week. Talk about what is the law, what shows our sin, what makes it, is it we're accountable for things we need to do, and then what is the good news that points to Jesus in the sermon. You have to listen to it. What is the main point of the sermon? A lot of times, and especially for what you'll hear, is pastors, we like to 
we like to focus on like a word or two or a phrase, right? And sometimes those phrases, those words will kind of help be that main point or help guide you to that main point of the sermon. So, so write down what you think the main point was and then how you can apply that main point, how you can apply the gospel um, or the law, whatever it is, to your life. Um, and and what, what I'd like for you guys to do, and, and try that this Sunday, okay? Uh, I'd like for you to do your first sermon Sunday, first sermon summary this Sunday. And then bring it back to me this next Wednesday, and, and I'll go over it. I'll tell you how great a job you guys did, and then I'll tell Brogan how awful he did. Right? And then, and then I will give it back to you so you can have some feedback on, on, on what you could have done a little bit better, um, what would have made it a little bit um, a little more clear. Okay? I'm, I'm pretty good at reading bad handwriting, but try your best to make it where I can read it. Okay? Because otherwise I'll have to turn it back to you and say do another one. And, and that wouldn't be good. All right? Um, uh, all right. How about this? Um, since I'm already running, running late with you guys. Because um, we're going to do the, the books of the Bible. Um, what if I, I will be here like 15 minutes early um, next week? So I will, I will just be here. So if you guys want to come like 15 minutes early and, and, and recite the books of the Bible for me then, um, that would be great. If you want to do it right now, I know I'm already keeping you guys a little bit late. So if you want to, if you want to do it now, that's great. But if you want to do it next week. Then, then that would be fine. Anybody want to do it now? That's kind of a dumb question, right? No, I don't, I don't want to do it. All right, let's pray, and then I will send you guys out, and we'll be back together this next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you for um, both the law and the gospel that you have given us in our lives. Help us, Lord, as we um, lead our lives to um, to look to the law as, as, a, as a guide for our lives, um, but also, Lord, help us to remember the gospel that that when we fail um, and that when we deserve eternal death, um, you've died for us and that we have eternal life. Thank you for um, sending, sending your son Jesus to die for us so that we can uh, be able to spend eternity with you. And bless us as we uh, go through this confirmation class. Um, help us to continue to grow in our faith through your word. And Lord, I just thank you for all that you have given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Sorry for keeping you guys late.